So, all right, we've come up about 20 to 30 meters out of the gully behind us, which has been cut down into these uh, glacial lacustrine deposits. We are at the north end of the Eliza Lake Research Forest, about 60 kilometers east of Prince George. We're in a, an old growth stand of, of uh, hybrid uh, white spruce and Engelmann spruce uh, subalpine fir. And we've got a stand that's been here for approximately 200, 250 years. This has never been logged. So we're looking at a typical stand in this part of East Central British Columbia in the wetter part of the subboreal spruce zone. The site that we're going to look at here has alluvic glycol formed on very fine textured glacial lacustrine sediments. These contain up to 80% clay and we're going to have a really good look at how this has influenced the way that soil forming processes have been expressed in this climate. a few meters from the break in the slope there and uh, yet this looks pretty wet here to me. Yeah, so what we're looking at Art is uh, a perched water table or the effects of a perched water table uh, in this, this uh, open pit. Uh, after the spring snow melt the, the water has accumulated on this level site and because of the nature of the underlying material it simply has nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. So I'll show you why that's happened. We'll just have a look at this okay. other pit just a few meters ahead here. Now, Paul, this uh, uh, landscape and the mater parent material here has been um, a story that's been evolving over the last 10,000 years, and I think a lot of it is laid open for us to see in this uh, uh, soil profile here. Do you want to give us a little bit of a discussion of the highlights here? Sure. So this is an example of a Luvic glycol. This is the most one of the most common soil types that we see at the Eliza Lake Research Forest on upland sites. Uh, the parent material here is uh, very fine textured glacial lacustrine sediments. The uh, clay content is up to 80% in the B and C horizons. We see the very strong influence that this parent material has had on the expression of soil forming processes at this site. There is the boundary between the forest floor and the top of the A horizon, so you can see that that's quite abrupt. There's a fairly clear structural development here. It's uh, a mixture of granular and, and fine blocky structure. And then it, there's a transition when we go down another five to 10 centimeters into the transition into the BTG horizon where the blocky structural units become somewhat coarser. This is where we see the greatest concentration of iron oxide models is right here and that corresponds to the location of this temporary water table that lasts for about a month in the springtime. So we're looking at this site now about two to three weeks after the end of the spring snow melt. This area would have had a couple of meters of snowpack over the winter so that's all melted. We're on a level microsite right here and so one of the results of this very fine textured material is that we have a temporary perched water table. So we can see nearby that uh, other pits that we haven't cleaned out are still quite full of water and that's simply the remnants of the spring snow melt. Now why that is staying uh, is because this very fine textured B horizon is quite impervious. So there's, there's simply no ability for water to move downward and unless we're on a sloping site, the water will just sit there until it is used up by the vegetation through transpiration. So the area that I'm pointing at is the top part of the BTG horizon. You notice that the blocky structural units here have a glistening appearance and that's the expression of the films of oriented clay which have formed on the surfaces of these, of these blocky aggregates as a result of the downward translocation of clay from the upper part of the soil profile over the last few thousands of years. So some of the consequences of this are visible in the soil profile. We can see that the, the roots really don't penetrate very far. They just barely get into the top of the BT horizon. 
The other thing that we can see when we look more closely is that we have a zone at the top of the BT horizon, which we've designated as a BTG horizon, where there's quite pronounced modeling. And that's those segregations of, of iron oxides are indicative of a fluctuating water table that results in periodic saturation and reducing conditions and mobilization of iron. So that's an example of a soil forming process that is strongly influenced by the parent material through the modification of the soil moisture regime. You've um, given us a um, uh, broad picture of the physical characteristics of this material, its fine texture and um, Obviously, that uh, plays a role in uh, biological activity, both uh, microbiological and macrobiological. Can you kind of go through what we can see here? Sure. Well, the forest floor that we're looking at here is a good example of what we call a moor humus, and it's characterized by uh, predominantly an F horizon, which has lots of evidence of uh, fungal involvement in decomposition. So you can peel back the forest floor and see. Uh, mats of, of uh, the fungal mycelia. There's a fairly clear boundary between the base of the forest floor and the top of the mineral soil horizons. And the thickness that we see here, which is roughly four to six centimeters, is typical of this uh, central and eastern part of the subboreal spruce zone in, in the BC central interior. So this is a, a typical example of a forest floor that we would see under a mature or old growth spruce fir forest in this part of central BC. In terms of where uh, organic carbon uh, is distributed in the soil profile, um, certainly the forest floor catches your eye, but in quantitative terms, there's actually more carbon in the mineral soil. The concentration is relatively low. It's usually no more than one or two percent, even in the A horizon. But because of the mass of all of this mineral material, that's where the bulk of the carbon is. And so uh, uh, looking at the entire soil profile down to about a meter, the, the bulk of the organic carbon is in the mineral soil. Now we'll see at other sites uh, farther east in climates that are moister, where there's less frequent fire disturbance, uh, the buildup of organic matter in the forest floor can be quite a bit thicker. And we will see forest floors that are uh, 10 to 15 centimeters in thickness, perhaps only 50 to 70 kilometers east of here in a wetter climate. So there's a very strong influence of, of climate on disturbance regime, which in this area is primarily driven by fire, which in turn affects the process of accumulation and decomposition of organic matter in, in the soil. Mm -hmm. So in addition to uh, carbon storage, um, in terms of either forest or subsequent agricultural use of soils like this, we might be interested in nutrient, other nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, and, and where would they be found in this? Well, in, in, a, in the forest ecosystem, I think the roots tell a lot of the story. If you look where the fine roots are distributed, they're primarily in the forest floor and in the top five to 10 centimeters of the mineral soil. So that's where a lot of the nutrient uptake is occurring, as well as uptake of water. Now one of the things to remember, because this is a very fine textured soil, the soil temperature regime tends to be cooler than it would be on a sandy soil in the same climate. And we will see that at, at another site not too many kilometers from here. Sites like this tend to be limited by, in the springtime, by the temporary high water table, and that's reflected in the restriction in root penetration. But that also keeps the soil fairly cool, which mm -hmm. is a restriction on microbial activity and the activity of roots. Mm -hmm. So again, it's another effect of this very fine textured parent material on the way in which uh, soil biological and chemical processes operate here.